First, the issue of House Bill 1329 and a retroactive vehicle taxes, a retroactive tax that would affect more than 122,702 Missourians. Let me walk you through this issue in some detail. Earlier this year, the Missouri Supreme Court unanimously ruled that a local use tax on vehicle purchases may not be imposed unless approved by the local people. Unlike a sales tax, which is imposed when a Missourian purchases a vehicle from a Missouri dealer, a use tax is charged when a Missourian purchases a vehicle from a friend, neighbor, or other private individual, or from a dealership located outside of Missouri. It is certainly appropriate for a local jurisdiction to charge a use tax, and many do. But those use taxes should be approved by all the people. At the time of the court's ruling, 39 Missouri counties and more than 90 municipalities had voter-approved use taxes. Since the legislature adjourned, voters in two additional counties, Dunklin and Osage, have approved a local use tax as well. But in other jurisdictions, such as the cities of Lorry and Tarkio, and in Howard County, voters rejected the use tax at the polls in August. In November, a use tax will be on the ballot in a number of other jurisdictions, including the cities of Kirksville and St. Joseph, and Adair and Buchanan counties. House Bill 1329 would undermine the right of local voters to weigh in on those local use taxes. This bill would ignore the will of the voters in jurisdictions where a use tax had been rejected and deny the right of the people to be heard in communities where a use tax will be on the ballot in November. It would also impose a retroactive tax without a vote of the people on more than 122,702 past vehicle sales. The court's ruling took effect on March 21st. Since that time, local use taxes have not been imposed in jurisdictions where voters have not approved the tax. On August 27th, I wrote to the General Assembly to explain that if House Bill 1329 becomes law, more than 122,702 Missourians would owe these retroactive taxes. In the week since I sent the letter, we have received requests from members of the General Assembly, including Senator Rob Shaw, about who exactly would be affected by this retroactive tax. All 122,702 Missourians who would owe these retroactive taxes live in a jurisdiction that did not have a voter approved use tax. Only 11% of these Missourians purchased a vehicle from an out of state dealer. An overwhelming 89% of these Missourians purchased their vehicle from a friend, a neighbor, or another private individual. Let me say that again. 89% or 108,000 of these sales were private, person to person transactions. Let me give you an example of this overwhelming majority of transactions. Think of a guy in rural Missouri who bought a pickup truck from his neighbor in a private transaction back in April after the court ruling. He lives in a jurisdiction without a voter approved use tax. When he registered that truck, he was correctly told he didn't owe any local taxes. Under this bill, the General Assembly attempted to turn back the clock and retroactively tax that purchase he made five months ago and thousands of other purchases like that across the state of Missouri. That's just plain wrong. Bottom line, this General Assembly should not circumvent Missouri voters and raise taxes on automobiles. Next, I'd like to briefly discuss the charge I have given to the Bipartisan Tax Credit Review Commission. Two years ago, the Commission issued a comprehensive report on Missouri's 61 tax credit programs, including recommendations on how to ensure that state tax credits deliver the best return on investment for the taxpayers. Effective tax credits create jobs, promote growth, and strengthen communities. But we continue to see exponential growth in tax credit redemptions. In fiscal year 2005, tax credit redemptions totaled $406.1 million. For fiscal year 2010, the year I formed the Tax Credit Review Commission, that total had grown to $522.9 million. Between fiscal year 10 and fiscal year 12, tax credit redemptions jumped by 20.4%, $629.5 million, setting an all-time record. Because of this continuing and significant trend, I've asked the Commission to refresh its report based on the latest data. 
In addition, I've asked them to solicit public testimony, including testimony from members of the General Assembly who would like to address the Commission. They will begin their work with a public hearing at 10 a.m. next Wednesday, September 12th, in Senate Committee Room 1 here in the Capitol. We have already had very productive conversations with members of the General Assembly about the work of the Commission, and I am confident that the tax credit reform will be an issue we can address early in the next legislative session. Because every dollar Missouri spends on its tax credits is a dollar we don't have to invest in other critical priorities such as education and public safety. This updated report from the Commission will help us understand which programs are truly delivering for Missouri taxpayers. Now, as a state, we must continue to balance our budget, hold the line on taxes, and keep our fiscal house in order. The Commission's report will help us do just that. Finally, I'd like to briefly discuss the issue of Senate Bill 749. I vetoed this bill because it would have shifted the ability to make decisions about birth control coverage away from women and their families and put it in the hands of insurance companies. I support the right of women to access and use birth control. This is a personal medical decision for a woman and her family, not something that should be dictated by an insurance company. I also respect the religious and moral beliefs of employers, and I value the strong religious protections that have been the law of the land here in Missouri for more than a decade. Senate Bill 749 puts women in their right to make their own personal decisions about the use of birth control. That is not the right path forward for Missouri. Now, these are just a few of the issues we'll be addressing in the coming weeks. I urge the General Assembly to keep this information in mind when they return to the Capitol next week. Meanwhile, we'll continue to work each and every day to create jobs, keep our fiscal house in order, and keep Missouri's economy moving forward. With that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Governor, on the bipartisan commission, do you have to make any personnel changes, or will the commissioners who were 15 years ago be the same group that comes next week? We've asked that the, the, uh, the same commissioners that were there, uh, we've invited them back because of their, one of the things that happened during that process was they were able to get uh, really far up the curve, the learning curve, and we think that that process, many of you were around, uh, is, is beneficial, and I think within that uh, group uh, continues to, uh, to have, um, you know, significant groups represented that are appropriate to the discussions as well as a, as a deep knowledge. I raise the question because Representative Barnes in reaction to your announcement last week was concerned that you have no members of the current House of Representatives on that panel anymore. The, the House members uh, timed out at, at the end of 2010, and one of the three senators is no longer here, Matt Barber. Do you need to add current lawmakers besides the two that are still on the panel? Well, let's look at the process. Let's look at refreshing the report. The most important thing, the hard work has been done, and now we need to just uh, see what has happened in the last few years to make sure that the, that the, the report is refreshed. And, and, and note the trend since that time. The document itself, I mean, it is a good, solid, uh, intellectual, thoughtful, fact-based document. Uh, so this is, we're not starting from zero here. Um, we're, we're starting from a, a commission that, uh, uh, that took a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, uh, put out a document that has not been, uh, uh, that while well, uh, some people obviously policy-wise may have uh, disagreements as to, to what should be done, there certainly has not been any significant I'm aware of. Uh, discussion about uh, uh, the imperfections of their analysis or are the facts contained within it. So what we're asking them to do is merely refresh that report so that we'll have a, a uh, uh, an up-to-date document uh, when the legislature comes back in the game. Governor, as, as you know, some of the, the leading support of scaling back tax credits in the Senate are turning on that out. It's going to be a, a substantially different Senate in January of next year. Are, are you looking at some sort of compromise? What are you thinking about how do you reach out to these folks that are coming into the Senate but you don't have the fire brands on, on scaling back tax credits that you had in the Senate? I don't know. I don't know if the fire, the fire brands went from, uh, you know, uh, were there when we set a record for the most, uh, most uh, dollars remaining. Um, so, in that sense. So, so we'll, I mean, we'll work with it. The numbers are the numbers. When, when, when you're up above, $600 million of the 629 range here uh, of expenditures. Uh, then you owe it both the taxpayers as well as, uh, as, uh, as uh, members of the legislature and others and, and, and policy leaders to analyze what those expenditures are, what kind of bang you're getting for the buck. Uh, and, and there are a number of complicated di differentials between the 16 different programs. Some of those uh, are job enhancing, job creating uh, type of instruments. Others are uh, uh, social service type uh, uh, credits. Uh, so I, I just think that the discussion should continue. 
Um, and I think that with the significant jump in the, in the redemptions, uh, it is a fiscal issue that, that should remain in the, in, the, uh, um, in the arena of discussion. Would you right. be asking them to find the compromise that's legislatively doable? No, I'm asking them to give us a report, uh, just like they did before, so that we know what uh, what these tax rates are, what they do, what their uh, what what, uh, what policy ideas they may have for the future. But no, this is not a, a legislative group. But the legislature will be back in January, uh, and we'll have plenty of time to work through. What we want them to do is refresh what is a strong, uh, uh, meaningful, uh, thoughtful, uh, fact-based document, um, so that we will have a center point. Of, of, of factual agreement uh, to have whatever discussions we have. And, and I think that's very important when we're dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars, especially to see a jump in a couple hundred million over the last few years, is to make sure that, 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 that everybody agrees on the facts. Um, and, and I think this commission did a good job before, and I expect that, uh, that, that they will again. Governor, but, on the car tax, you only need a handful of Democrats to thwart a veto override. Have, what have you done to talk to House Democrats in one-on-one -on -one conversations, and how much progress are you making? Um, we continue to talk to folks about this. About this. I thought that uh, you know, once the, one of the reasons to, to, to talk publicly today is to is to uh, to clarify on 122,000 just how few of those were were in essence dealer transactions with only 11 you know, percent. Because I felt like in public there was uh, you know a, a, the sense that those were all um, you know. Dealer out of state. When you see 89, you know, almost 90 percent, 89 percent this way, uh, I wanted to get these facts out since we have a you know limited amount of time coming out there. But I, I, I have talked to uh, members, and I'll continue. To. Governor, I've, I've read the Supreme Court's ruling on this, and it talked extensively about the sales, local sales tax applied to out-of-state purchases. It really never mentions in that ruling the local sales tax that's applied to purchases between individuals. It does not explicitly mention that. Can you, you're an attorney, can you explain to me why it applies to sales taxes between, why it applies to purchases between individuals? That's where it was collected. I mean, well, you know, that, that's, how it was, that's how it was collected. Um, and, uh, but, but, the, but the court ruling really talks about purchases brought out of state. I mean, it doesn't specifically say in there. The fact basis that came up you know, it's just like any other lawsuit. When you bring one set of facts, it covers a broader, it potentially covers a broader area of the law. Just because the the, the plaintiff was in that so was from that angle, doesn't mean that this does not cover these other transactions. And constantly, that's why we're talking today that to amplify both the retroactive nature, the fact that they would go back in time and charge people that had already purchased cars, a sales tax, they you know, a use tax that they did not have to pay at the time they purchased it. In other words, we would have the burden to go back and collect taxes from people, uh, and to and to further point that out as to what the what types of transactions are covered uh, under the court rule. Do you think it's unconstitutional to impose a tax retroactively? <clears throat> Given the fact that the Constitution says you can't do a retrospective law. <laughs> um, well, it's not an analysis we're going to have to get to. It just needs not to override the veto and we need to move on. The best way not to get 122,000 people taxed uh, is for them, uh, is for the veto that I laid out, which is proper, uh, to stand. Uh, and the fact that over 108,000 of those transactions are private to private transactions uh, gives even more reason, uh, in, my, in my view, as to why. And the fact that, that jurisdiction after jurisdiction is putting this on the ballot. Uh, this is something properly placed there. This is something that has been passed since the end of the legislative session in at least two jurisdictions, and a number of them have it on before. Running around the voters um, for any tax in this situation, uh, much less a retroactive one, uh, to run around the voters to, to say that you can charge it, uh, go back and collect a tax for something that uh, the, the court said is not taxable, um, seems to be, uh, uh, you know, not good public policy, uh, not good fiscal policy, uh, and as I said before, I just don't think it's right. But Governor, no, no county count on that revenue. Well, uh, if they don't, if the legislature doesn't listen to your plea and they override your veto, 122,000 people get a tax bill. 
108,000 of those folks are getting those tax bills are not folks that dealt with dealers, but those folks that sold uh, cars to each other. And we're going to have to figure out a way to go collect taxes from people who were not charged at that time. Are they setting the state up for another lawsuit on this retroactive, retrospective tax? I think, Bob, I think that uh, I think you make a, a solid point. I mean, I don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about Senate Blue but nothing in this bill would, would fundamentally change the, 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 uh, the underlying legal theory of this. Um, that, that the people need to vote if you're going to have, um, you know, raising taxes. That's what that's that's what the law is. That's what that's what the way we operate here in the state. And to try to circumvent the voters and to, to raise the tax is bad enough. But to circumvent the voters and do it readily, and then to say this on the basis of of uh, helping uh, dealers, when in reality 90% of the transactions are person to person, just puts a, a, a. I just wanted to make sure that the facts. Uh, the accurate facts of this were, were in, the, in the public uh, domain. Governor, what about the county budgets that depend on this, on this revenue and the municipalities that depend on this revenue? What about the argument that if the bill isn't put into effect and if the taxes aren't collected retroactively, those, those municipal finances would be uh, in jeopardy? Like all other uh, taxes, if, if it has to go to the vote of people, it to go to the vote of people. Uh, passing retroactive taxes is not uh, something we do. Passing taxes without a vote of the people is not something we do. Um, and, uh, but putting something on the ballot takes a long time. What do they do in the meantime? Well, two counties put it on this summer it already passed. A number have it on in November uh, of this year. Uh, and clearly, once that Supreme Court decision came down early in the year, I think everyone had a clear roadmap as to, as to uh, a way to uh, uh, to ask the voters to be involved. I mean, the folks at Duncan County passed that tax. Uh, they put it on the ballot after the Supreme Court decision. It went on the ballot. It passed almost two to one. Um, local jurisdictions have, have the ability to uh, uh, to do that. Are you confident legally? Not just impressed with a legal question. I'm not confident. I mean, I don't think I'm going to talk a lot. That's what I need to do. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's right in the bill. Right in the veto. I mean, when you look at it, it's very, very clear. That's why I laid it out in the veto message. That's why I communicated directly to the legislature in a written fashion about this and why I'm, uh, I am where I am. It, it is designed to be a retroactive tax. That's it's specifically in the bill. Um, that was their effort and their intent and their, their intent. So, so if you have over you wouldn't encourage the Attorney General to challenge it. You would accept that if it's all written, it fully applies to. 122,000 people are going to get have to pay taxes, and otherwise did not have to pay those taxes on vehicle sales, including 108,000 private vehicle sales. Uh, if the legislature decides to pass this retroactive tax on on people that buy vehicles in Missouri. Governor, you're, you're you're it's a different subject too, but I assume you're still going to the Democratic convention. Soon. What is your role going to be there? Um, I'm, I'm, I'll be on this tomorrow night and, and Thursday. Um, I'm a delegate. I'll, I'll do what delegates do. You don't have any role to speak, uh, either to <laughs> on stage or Missouri's delegation? or. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking to Missouri's delegation, certainly, and on um, uh, Thursday morning. And do you have any uh, events down there that, I don't know, pair governors with the, the presidential slate or anything like that? Um, I am sure in a relatively small area, I'll, I'll uh, get a chance to see many other of my uh, fellow governors. I, I, I do not have on my schedule having the opportunity to, to see the president or the vice president. Okay. Governor, uh, Ed Martin has said several times in his campaign for attorney general that Mr. Costa has not done his job in terms of trying to prevent the Secretary of State from putting bad ballot language on, on the ballot. And it came up again today at a news conference in connection with the trees ruling really last week. My question is to you in your past of 16 years as Attorney General. Does the Attorney General have the authority, the legal authority, to tell the Secretary of State his or her language won't work? Um, I think that the, the, uh, um, the laws in the Constitution give the Secretary of State both the, the uh, give, the, give uh, that position the responsibility to draft that language. Um, and, and consequently, it's a, it's a power contained in, in the Secretary of State's office. Now, when things get into court and you're going to work out a settlement or things of that nature, then clearly the Attorney General's uh, office potentially is involved in those. And, and in the 16 years I was 
uh, involved uh, as Attorney General. Certainly, we're in, involved in, in situations where, especially because of the timing, you worked very closely with your client to make sure you had uh, uh, language that uh, uh, it had to be uh, uh, clarified in some fashion that you could work to do it. But the, the power lies uh, uh, to do this about the titles in the Secretary of State's office. So, when the law says the Attorney General has to approve something before it can go to the ballot, that and just the legal form of content, it's not as to substance, the legal form of content uh, requirement on bringing him more. Sounds somewhat related to the law. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. well, there's a cigarette tax increase on the ballot. What's your position on that? The, uh, well, I mean, we'll wait to the public's decision on that in November. It gets in front of them. Uh, I, I said, clearly, when I, uh, uh, for you to govern, I, I, I attempted to, uh, and, and we'll continue to hold the line of taxes. But I think uh, with the public uh, out there, I, I don't expect to be active in any way in that, uh, uh, in that campaign. We'll wait the, the verdict of, uh, you know, Missouri this fall. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thank you.